Y'all get a bonus today. You get two scripture readings. I hope you're ready. I'm going to start right up with our first reading from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, because we got a lot of scripture to read, and a lot of sermon to preach and hear. So Isaiah says, in the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a high and exalted throne, the edges of his robe filling the temple. Winged creatures were stationed around him. Each had six wings. With two they veiled their faces. With two their feet. And with two they flew about. They shouted to each other saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heavenly forces. All the earth is filled with God's glory. The door frame shook at the sound of their shouting and the house was filled with smoke. I said, mourn for me, I'm ruined. I'm a man with unclean lips, and I live among a people with unclean lips. Yet I've seen the King, the Lord of heavenly forces. Then one of the winged creatures flew to me, holding a glowing coal that he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt has departed, and your sin is removed. Then I heard the Lord's voice saying, Whom should I send? And who will go for us? I said, I'm here. Send me. God said, go and say to this people, listen intently, but don't understand. Look carefully, but don't comprehend. Make the minds of this people dull. Make their ears deaf and their eyes blind, so they can't see with their eyes or hear with their ears or understand with their minds and turn and be healed. I said, how long, Lord? And God said, until cities lie ruined with no one living in them, until there are houses without people and the land is left devastated. The Lord will send the people far away and the land will be completely abandoned. Even if one tenth remain there, they will be burned again, like a terebinth or an oak, which when it is cut down leaves a stump. Its stump is a holy seed. I'm going to move right into our call story from Luke 5 today. One day Jesus was standing beside Lake Gennesaret when the crowd pressed in around him to hear God's word. Jesus saw two boats sitting by the lake. The fishermen had gone ashore and were washing their nets. Jesus boarded one of the boats, the one that belonged to Simon, then asked him to row out a little distance from the shore. Jesus sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he finished speaking to the crowds, he said to Simon, row out farther into the deep water and drop your nets for a catch. Simon replied, Master, we've worked hard all night and caught nothing, but because you say so, I'll drop the nets. So they dropped the nets and their catch was so huge that their nets were splitting. They signaled for their partners in the other boat to come and help them. They filled both boats so full that they were about to sink. When Simon Peter saw the catch, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Leave me, Lord, for I'm a sinner. Peter and those with him were overcome with amazement because of the number of fish they caught. James and John, Zebedee's sons, were Simon's partners, and they were amazed too. Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will be fishing for people. As soon as they brought the boats to the shore, they left everything and followed Jesus. What do you dream about? I'm not talking about your ordinary overnight dreams, but what are your bigger dreams? For yourself, for your family, your faith? your vocation, your community. You understandably hear these questions addressed to you as individuals. We have been trained to hear sermons that way. Today, I'm going to challenge you to hear these questions collectively as the body of Christ. So let me ask again, what are our dreams for the body? And what does that mean for our faith, our vocations, and our community. See, reframing questions can bring insight, but 
it can also beg some clarification. In this case, it might cause you to ask, well, what do you mean by our? It's reasonable to assume, given that I'm a pastor at this congregation, Markham Woods Presbyterian Church, that I'm limiting my question to this congregation. But you know, we record these sermons, so it's also reasonable to assume that when I say our, I include the four or five people who might watch this on YouTube. <laughs> I'm being facetious, of course. Honestly, I, I don't go back to look at how often folks watch past sermons, but in a digitally connected and mobile world, the pronoun our has a lot more flexibility. We apply it as we see fit, for better or for worse. When I say our, especially in relation to big dreams, it could signal a generous and expansive grouping or a stingy and restrictive one. So just to be clear, assume that the message today is generous and expansive in its framing. So let's let these questions linger through the sermon and beyond. What do we dream about? And maybe we should think also, what should we dream about? You know, when you hear the word dream in a church during Black History Month, it might cause your antenna to rise a little bit. You might think, oh yes, Here's the obligatory citation of Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech during Black History Month. We're checking a box off on a checklist. Now, given that potential signal interference, let me ask you if you have ever read or heard the entirety of the speech. I know folks here, some were living at that time. It's not that long ago. But if uh, you have had a chance to reflect on it, how long ago was the last time that you did so? When did you last explore or revisit its context? I'm going to help you with that exercise a little bit. Dr. King delivered it in August of 1963 as part of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. And while it is the most famous speech that day, it was not the only one. This march was organized as a rally of support for civil rights legislation going through Congress and to protest the twin evils of racism and economic deprivation. Among the 10 demands from the sponsors of the march were desegregation of school districts, job training, workplace equality, a national minimum wage of at least $2 an hour, and ending housing discrimination. 10 people offered remarks that day on the National Mall, expertly organized by nonviolent protest expert, Bayard Rustin, in less than three months, an era long before the internet, mind you, he had hoped for a crowd of 100,000, it turned out to be 250,000. Did you know that the I Have a Dream segment of Dr. King's speech, the very name that we know his speech by, almost didn't happen? Were it not for the encouraging question of Sister Mahalia Jackson, the first gospel artist to win a Grammy, and who sang, I've been buked and I've been scorned, before Dr. King spoke, we might have been left calling it the bad check speech. Dr. King began with this image of a bad check, representing failed promises of freedom for all people in America. After telling marchers to return home, knowing that somehow this situation can and will be changed, Martin heard Mahalia speak. Sister Jackson said, tell them about the dream, Martin. Tell them about the dream. And he did. He told the quarter of a million folk gathered there about his dreams of equality, of brotherhood, of children holding hands no matter their color, of every valley exalted and every mountain and hill made low, of character content over skin color. Like all of his writings, this speech was infused with the portents as well as the promises of scripture, like exalted valleys and lowered mountains. Those are words we usually hear during Advent, and they come from Isaiah 40. They are prophetic words of equality, as germane now as ever. 
And these images of Isaiah are always fresh and striking. And today's reading from chapter 6 is no exception. It's the vision of an awesome presence of God. And at the same time, the weighty nature of Isaiah's call. In Isaiah's telling, the temple is barely big enough to hold the hem of God's robe. Six-winged angels fly all above, covering their unworthy body parts with their wings as they sing of God's holiness. The temple shakes and smokes at the tumult, and all poor Isaiah can say is, Woe is me, my lips are unclean, all the lips of my people are unclean, yet I have seen the Lord of heavenly forces. And then we hear, and maybe see in our mind's eye, this most unnerving image. An angel drawing a hot coal from the altar, pressing it to Isaiah's lips and blotting out the sin. Thus purified, Isaiah is bold to answer God's question of who will go for us by saying, here I am, send me. Only he doesn't know what sort of sending this is, does he? It reminds me of a story of James and John. According to Mark and Matthew, they asked to sit on the left and the right hand of Jesus when he is king. Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking for. Let me pause and give a shout out to our new church officers, who we ordained and installed last week in the second service who also didn't know exactly what they were agreeing to. It's not that bad. I just, just wanted to say thanks for, for stepping up. Before Isaiah has a second thought, God is sending him with a message of woe to the nation of Israel and commissioning him with the ominous task of deadening their senses to the point of no return. They will be numb to the destruction in their midst, and their land will be devastated. Not even a tenth, not even a tithe, will remain after the final conflagration. It disappoints me that we don't hear Isaiah's response. Was he as terrified at the prospect of delivering this message as he was at God's very presence in the temple? Was he silently resigned to God's burdensome call? Maybe he took some perverse joy in it, as some bearers of bad news do. You know those types. Whatever the case, the lesson of Isaiah's call is that when you see God, life is forever changed. Now, Isaiah was called to do some hard prophetic work. Terry, I'm going to ask you a question here. I think his superhero, his superhero name would have been Doomsayer. Does that sound pretty good? All right, you write that comic. Now, Dr. King was not called to that level of prophecy, but he was equipped to offer words of both challenge and hope, to speak comfort to his people as well as truth to power. Earlier in 1963... Eight white Southern religious leaders publicly called out Dr. King and his fellow protesters, calling their presence in Birmingham, Alabama, unwise and untimely. In response, he wrote a lengthy letter in longhand, not typed, six pages in small print on a PDF file on my computer. While he sat in Birmingham jail after a nonviolent demonstration, and in that prophetic long hand, he wrote, I am in Birmingham because injustice is here. Just as the 8th century prophets left their little villages and carried their, thus saith the Lord, far beyond the boundaries of their hometowns. And just as the Apostle Paul left his little village of Tarsus and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ to practically every hamlet and city of the Greco-Roman world, I too am compelled to carry the gospel of freedom beyond my particular hometown. Like Paul, I must constantly respond 
to the Macedonian call for aid. He wrote later, history is the long and tragic story of the fact that privileged groups seldom give up their privileges voluntarily. Individuals may see the moral light and voluntarily give up their unjust posture, but as Reinhold Niebuhr has reminded us, groups are more immoral than individuals. We know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. We must come to see with the distinguished jurist of yesterday that justice too long delayed is justice denied. You know, as president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Dr. King was responding to an invitation from an affiliate chapter of that organization to participate in a nonviolent direct action program after patient negotiation with Birmingham city leaders to halt injustices there failed. In other words, his team needed him and he stepped up to the plate. They knew, and he knew, that working alone is ineffective. It's the same principle that motivated that impressive gathering on the National Mall just a few months later. And it's a principle that Jesus himself instituted in his ministry, as we have read in our lesson from Luke today. Every gospel has call stories of various disciples, and Luke's version of the call of three of the most well-known disciples is unique in its sideways approach. First, Jesus has a need, a need of a boat to offer himself a bit of breathing room at the lake shore because the crowds are pressing in too much. But they're eager to hear the word, and he wants to have the right setting for it. Simon, whose night of fishing has come up empty, stops washing his net and obliges his request. After the lesson ends, Jesus asks him to go out a bit and drop his nets again. You remember what happens next. Simon is dubious, but obliges Jesus once more. His reward is a catch so great that even his buddies James and John barely have enough draft left in their fish-laden boats to make it to shore. What would you do in this situation? Like Isaiah, Simon, at this point in the story called Simon Peter, is suddenly aware of his own smallness and sinfulness in the presence of such wonder. If Jesus had a burning coal, Simon would have insisted that Jesus press his lips with it. And like the seraph in Isaiah, Jesus has words of reassurance for him. Do not fear. Now you will fish for people. But why bother if you're the Son of God, the anointed, who can dispel demons, cure the sick, and astound the masses with your teaching? Why bother building a team? Of course, we know why. He was not going to be around to do it all. He needed to develop leaders for that day when he ascended to the heavens. So in the meantime, he had to teach them some servant leadership model of ministry. Humbling oneself to serve everyone else. Loving God first and neighbor second. Spreading the good news. Baptizing. Healing. Feeding. And replicating that model to the ends of the earth. Now, Jesus wasn't one to indulge in pithy sayings. If anything, he turned conventional and proverbial wisdom on its head. Indeed, just a bit before this gospel lesson in Luke, Jesus was teaching in the synagogue in his hometown in Nazareth and said to them, doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, doctor, cure yourself. Things didn't get any better from there, and he had to disappear in their midst as they tried to throw him off of the nearest cliff. So it was with some hesitation that I changed my sermon title this week to Teamwork Makes the Dream Work. I have a good reason, but before I share it, let me explore the larger context of that clever phrase. 
It's the title of a 2002 motivational slash leadership book written by a fellow named John C. Maxwell. He appears to have coined the phrase, Mr. Maxwell is also a preacher. And for some reason, that does not surprise me. We love those pithy quotes, don't we? But there's more to the quote than the book title version. The full version is, teamwork makes the dream work, but a vision becomes a nightmare when the leader has a big dream and a bad team. How's that for leadership lingo? Even if it is true to a degree, there's still this little bit of pithiness to it that is hard for me to overcome. But let's give it a shot. So here's why I decided to change my sermon title. This past week, I casually observed as a news photographer from WFTV tried his darndest to keep up with uh, a cavalcade of kindergartners on the playground. We have pictures of, of that. Uh, is there a playground shot? There he is. He's taking a much needed rest here. So he's trying to chase these kindergartners around while hoisting his camera at just the right angle. He's a bit of a perfectionist, but suffice to say, what he was doing is easier said than done. There he is. Oh boy, I was tired just watching him. So our friend Martha Sugalski, who comes to the second service and whose kids are uh, in the kindergarten at HCA, she was reporting a story in her series, Spread Love and Kindness, about how our kindergarten includes a boy named Frankie a special needs child who is nonverbal. Now the crux of the story, which is going to air this Friday at 4 o'clock, the crux of the story is how Frankie's classmates embrace him and how the preschool is able to integrate his needs into the common life of that class. Martha, Cheryl, and I were watching on the playground out there as Frankie's classmates were pushing a pedal car that he was seated in around the playground. You saw that picture. And Martha asked what I was preaching on this week, and my original sermon title, Just Do the Work, sounded a little dull next to her suggestion. Teamwork makes the dream work. <laughs> now, I've, I've heard her say that before, so uh, it, it's always in this casually positive way, and she's always so upbeat, you, you can't help but you know, be infected by it. So in light of Jesus beginning to call his team together, that switch made sense. And then, as the Spirit does, moves to make it even more sense, as it sort of matched this theme of the march on Washington and Dr. King's dream. You know, watching these HCA kindergartners move uh, their friend around the playground, I had a mini vision of the kingdom. People of every color, shape, ethnicity, race, ability, identity, orientation, working together for the common good. And I thought of the Hawaiian word, ohana, a word that means family, but is so much bigger. It's best expressed by Lilo in the movie Lilo and Stitch. It means nobody gets left behind. In the Birmingham jail letter, Dr. King also wrote, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. If we are to make the dream work, we need more than teamwork. We need Dr. King's vision of the beloved community, a community where we embrace our mutuality, share our garment of destiny, and resolve with Lilo to say, no one gets left behind. We need to drop everything that distracts us so we can follow Jesus, trusting that with his guidance, our boats will nearly sink with the abundance of blessings that he promises. Holy, 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 the seraphs proclaimed. Do not be afraid, Jesus assured called together as the family of God, we can make this dream work. Amen.